thank you, thank you, uh, David, and uh, thank you also, Diane, for uh, hosting this wonderful conference uh, for the second time. Uh, thank you for all the efforts of switching online and matching all our slots with all our time differences. This has been a massive work and uh, we really appreciate uh, your efforts and congratulations. Um, I, will, I have a, sh a brief presentation that I would like to, to share. Um, let me see, I would have to put it in presentation mode. Okay, do you see this well? Great. So um, I want to thank also the organizers for the recognition to the paper and for the invitation to deliver uh, this uh, keynote speech. Uh, this paper or the ideas that are embedded in this paper were presented in, in, in a sketchy format uh, last year and um, following um, inputs that I receive in the uh, conference and especially comments and feedbacks from David, I decided to move forward and to uh, delve into and try to develop the ideas that were sketched or timidly presented last year. And to do that, as David was saying, I uh, conducted a survey on uh, legal tech companies in the European, in the European level. And this is basically what the presentation will consist of. So I will uh, briefly present the ideas on automation of law. Then I will move to the presentation of the uh, survey. And then I'll try to get some ideas and conclusions by interpreting the survey on the relationship of law and technology. So my question, and I think uh, David posted this in a very clear uh, way is whether there are legal rules that are better suited for technology than others. Is, this is the central question. When law interacts with technology, interacts with traditional coding, or when law interacts with blockchain, or interacts with machine, different types of machine learning, including natural language processing or predictive analytics, are there legal rules that work better with technology. For example, if you decide to embed a contract in blockchain, okay? For example, let's imagine a shipping contract whereby the payment would be released after the meeting of certain milestones. For example, delivery under certain conditions, uh, following normal income terms, etc. Is it the same to apply the law of Hong Kong than to apply German law to this contract? When you want the contract to work autonomously in a platform as blockchain. This is precisely what I want to try to answer today. And when we say whether a law is better suited for technology, I'm referring to the fact that automation is higher in the sense that technology can operate without the intervention of human experts, whether lawyers or other type of experts. I have Last year, and this is still a term that I'm giving thought to, I have termed this characteristic of the law as technological efficiency. And what do I mean by technological efficiency? Is the fitness of law to interact autonomously with IT systems without human intervention. In the sense that a law would be, have a higher degree of technological efficiency when it requires less intervention of lawyers and experts. And the other way around, when the law would be less technological efficiency, efficient when it requires a higher intervention of lawyers and experts, because it would mean that it would be less able to operate autonomously, autonomously here meaning without human beings. So my question, whether there are legal rules that are better suited for technology than others could potentially imply a new legal methodology. So you know, and we are all aware of the different legal methodologies that exist uh, in history, but for example, going to, uh, connected to what David said before, for example, in the US has been 
very popular, the so-called law and economics, where they look to the economic efficiency of rules, seeing which rule, which legal system is better in terms of economic efficiency. More recently, this has been, let's say, rethought in the perspective of behavioral law and economics, where they take into consideration the behavior or the psychological elements of the parties to a contract, for example. My question here is, instead of looking to the economic efficiency, can we look to the technological efficiency? Can we analyze the laws and see which law is better for technology? This could be a, a, a perspective that goes across fields. You could think this in banking, in financing, in public law, in private law, and try to analyze which law is better for technology. As I said before, is it better to have this contract under Hong Kong law? Is it better to have under the law of Germany, under the law of uh, the UK, English law, sorry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For that, I wanted to get the perspective of the participants in the market. And for that, I conducted a survey uh, at a uh, European level. The survey was conducted to the so-called legal tech companies, companies that provide legal services without lawyers or with a minimum intervention of lawyers. And I decided to address legal tech companies because they are applying law without lawyers. You know that technology is being used in lots of sectors in the economy, but legal tech apply, uh, use technology in the provision of legal services. They're replacing lawyers, they're applying the law, okay? And as you know, there are, there are different types of legal tech companies, for example, those that conduct um, due diligence process automatically, leaving aside that tedious work that was historically conducted by junior lawyers of revising lots of documents. Uh, they could also be e-marketplaces whereby they connect clients with um, lawyers. There can be document reviewers, which is also something that is increasing, the process of revising documents uh, and controlling changes in contracts, for example. And the probably most sophisticated version is those that uh, operate in litigation, okay? In the sense that, of course, intervention in court is for the time being in most countries still done by human beings. But there is a, an out-of-court phase that is being done by these legal tech companies. Out of court, I mean the assessment of the claim, the estimation of compensation, and also the, the claim and filing a claim out of court, demanding payment to the companies uh, that could be in breach of contract. And I've decided to choose, to choose litigation because it involves legal reasoning. Okay, and legal reasoning is one of the most difficult areas to automize. Okay, it's much easier to automize a due diligence process than to automize litigation precisely because it involves the processing, the assessment of the claim, which is one of the most complex tasks that a lawyer can do. And I've restricted the assessments to the five largest markets for legal services in Europe, which is France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the United Kingdom. And I will present here some of the main results of uh, the survey, because it's important then to connect and to analyze how it impacts the law. As you see by this graph, the blue area of the graph corresponds to legal tech companies that claim airline claims alone. They are sole purpose companies that only claim airline claims. This is the blue area is 45% of the overall companies. And if you add the brown area to the left, which says Air Plus Bank, these companies that are on top of airline claims, they claim banking. Overall, they make more than 50%, okay? Uh, second in rank is the green area, which corresponds to the general platform claims. They claim all type of claims. And from there, you have different areas, tenancy in Germany, um, trained claims, employment claims, telecommunications claims, insurance claims, 
in different and larger areas. But stick with this big picture because it's important. Why are almost 50% of the companies claiming airline claims? In terms of the technology deployed in the service, we see that the companies are using sophisticated technologies, starting from coding, which is 20%, the yellow, the yellow uh, column, but they use also other types of machine learning, 35%, predictive analytics, 25%, natural language processing, 15%, and blockchain, 5%. So these companies are really using state-of-the-art technology uh, to meet the demands of the clients. And the first conclusion comes, and you could, very obvious, what is the relationship between the law and technology, the provision of legal services and technology. Well, they have a direct relationship and this came out from the survey. So in the sense that the better the technology, the higher degrees of automation a company is able to achieve. So there were different companies, for example, operating the same sector, for example, airlines, some using traditional coding, other using predictive analytics, the company that uses predictive analytics is able to rely less on lawyers to work autonomously in a higher degree than that one that uses traditional coding. This is something intuitive, nothing new here. But the second conclusion is more important. The relationship between automation and uh, the provision of legal services, and, sorry, and the use of technology is not proportional in the sense that that could, it's true that the better the technology, the higher automation you achieve, but not to the same extent. So there are two companies operating in different sectors, for example, airlines and insurance, using the same technology, for example, machine learning, including predictive analytics, and the degrees of automation that they reach are completely different, completely different, even, the same company with the same technology, but in respect of different types of claims, they reach different levels of automation. Here, remember, implying whether you need an intervention of lawyers or you do not. So the first conclusion that comes out from this is that technology is not the sole explanation to increase level of automation better or a higher investment in technology is not the sole answer to automation. Instead, I believe, and this came out from the survey, that the applicable law to the claim is important. The applicable law determines the extent, the degree of automation. So by trying to get which law could be more efficient, which law could work better with technology, I classify the companies by sector. By sector, remember, the ones that I mentioned before, airlines, general plane platforms, employment, banking, debt collection, tenancy, etc. Why? Because by getting the sector, it's, and knowing the countries in, the op in which they operate, it's possible to get the applicable law to the claim. And hence, it's possible to analyze the applicable law. And from there, it's possible to get, I, I classified in four, a classification of companies. Those ones that reach a high level of automation where they do not need lawyers in the uh, processing and uh, filing of claims, medium high, medium low or low, whereby they still need lawyers to assess the claims, they still need lawyers, experts to estimate the compensation that is due. When we speak about automation and litigation, there are at least <clears throat> two main tasks that a lawyer does in this pre-litigation phase. The first one, very important, is to assess the plausibility of a claim. When the lawyer receives the client, the first thing that a lawyer should do or a lawyer does is to assess whether the claim that the client brings is plausible, is likely to succeed, and to what extent. This requires to match, to assess the facts 
against the backdrop of the applicable law. This is what I spoke about, tough or complex legal reasoning. We have to take the facts, the particular facts, match them against the applicable law and say, okay, you have a plausible claim or not. When we speak about automation in litigation, we're saying that this is not done by a lawyer. This is done by an IT system. A second important task that lawyers do normally with the cooperation of experts, for example, economists, is to estimate compensation. So, of course, this also has a legal analysis as to what damages could be compensated, but then there is a phase of calculation of those damages um, that it's also necessary, and most jurisdictions require this to determine, to be determined by the lawyers at the time of filing a complaint. This task, when we speak about automation in litigation, is also done without the intervention of lawyers or other experts. So with this, the, after the server, I classified the companies I said in four. Those ones that reach a high level of, of automation means that the IT system is able to assess the plausibility of the claim, say if the claim is solid, and also to estimate the compensation that is due without the intervention of a lawyer or a human expert, autonomously. If it's medium high, the system is able to determine the plausibility of the claim, but not to estimate compensation. If it's medium low, the system can calculate the compensation, but cannot assess the plausibility of the claim. For that, they need lawyers. And that's why I put it medium low, because it's easier to estimate the compensation than to assess the plausibility of a claim. Whereas those companies that are low degree of automation, they can do nothing. In the sense that they have automized the management of the portfolio of clients, but they need lawyers to assess whether the claim is viable and they need expert or lawyers to calculate compensation. And following that, there are three types of claims in which companies reach a high level of automation. The first one, remember the blue part of the graph is airlines. In airline claims, the best performing companies prescind of lawyers in the estimation of, of uh, compensation and in the assessment of the plausibility of the claim. Same thing occurs in banking claims and also in tenancy in Germany. And the reason I won't go too far into this is because Germany has uh, rent control uh, in, in certain uh, cities and this facilitates, because of how the law is drafted, this facilitates uh, automation. In the medium high level, we find companies that deal with telecommunications claims. Remember that each type of claim has its applicable law behind, which is already indicative. If the technology is not enough as an explanation, the type of claim is already indicative of how the law is impacting automation. In the medium low, meaning companies that cannot assess the plausibility of the claim, but can estimate compensation is the debt collection companies, in the sense that they can, it's easy to estimate autonomously how much is due, but they cannot say if the invoice really corresponds to a claim that is valid and sustainable in court. Whereas in the low level of automation, claims difficult to automize is general claim platforms. They deal with a multiplicity of different claims and also insurance claims. So this graph is important, as I said before, because it's indicative of the law that hangs behind. And whenever we have done this classification, this was controlled with the success rates in court. So meaning it's not that the system just simply says, this is a fantastic claim, you have this compensation, then you go to court and this is a lottery. No, this has been assessed in, by the success rates in court and those companies with high levels of automations are successful in court and moreover, they have the more stable range, range of success, which is tradition normally high above 75% and up to 100% of success. 
So to the question, original question if whether there are legal rules that are better suited for technology than others, my answer is yes. Following the survey, at least at this point, my initial answer is yes. The technological efficiency, that characteristic of the law that makes them better suited for technology varies. There are degrees. There are laws which are better for technology than others. We've seen this in these different uh, sectors, for example. There are some laws in the European Union, airlines, banking, which is heavily influenced by EU law, and tenancy in Germany, which has its own specific characteristics, that they have something that makes them optimal for automation. And that something can be summarized or at least has two main features, which is, I, I have termed this as objectivization and standardization of the law. And I will explain now what I mean by that. But when, I, when the participants to the survey would ask about how important is the homogeneity and standardization of the law without explaining what this means, I didn't want to bias their answers. Just simply this question among many others was, answer, was asked. For 64% of them, it's very important. For 29% is essential. Meaning for over 90% of the participants in, this sec in legal tech companies in Europe understand that the characteristics of the law are important for the business, okay? More than 90%. Whereby, once again, what do these claims have as important as is special, so as to make them more fit for automation. The first characteristic I said was objectivization. And this has to do with the interaction of the law with facts, okay? Meaning objectivization refers to a possibility of non-intervention of a human expert, for example, in determining a breach of contract. For example, if you have to determine whether an airline has committed a breach because a flight is delayed, this is a binary answer, yes or no. Is the flight delayed or not? This can be done without human experts. The companies operating in this sector, they resort to flight data. They connect with the flight data that is given by the airports among others, and they determine the system demands, yes, the flight is delayed, full stop. There is no need of human intervention. Whereas if you had a clause saying that there would be liability if this, there is a breach of the principle of good faith, well, this is more difficult to automize because you require intervention of an expert assessing whether really this has gone against uh, good faith. And here, of course, you could get degrees, huh? a, a high degree uh, on objectivization in the law could be a zero one breach. Is the flight delayed? Yes or no? This is easier to automate, plus strict liability. Following that breach, you have liability. In a medium level, so less objectivized, you could have a breach which is not zero one. For example, I bought this T-shirt, is, de is it defective? I need someone who to assess this. This is not computable, plus strict liability. And in a low level of objectivization, which means it's difficult to automize, you could have a breach that has to be assessed by a human expert. Plus, for example, it requires to gain liability that there was a breach of a duty of diligence. For example, could think of liability of a manager, the liability of a corporate director. Okay? In, in most systems, this is based on negligence, hence would be very difficult to automate. The second characteristic that I mentioned is standardization. This has to do with the applicability of a rule to numerous cases without variations. This is very important, for example, for predictive analytics. Predictive analytics is able, is able to predict an outcome. And for that, the more standardized the inputs, the more standardized the outputs would be. It would be more predictable. So for example, going back to the, an, an example, you think of a fixed compensation. In the event of delay, you will receive a thousand euros thousand dollars and this applies to anyone who is in the same plane well this is easier to automize 
that if you have to assess compensation as contract law traditionally does on a case by case basis, this is more difficult to predict, not impossible, for the time being more difficult to predict. Another example of standardization would be an unfair term in a standard form contract. For example, if a, if a court in some, some system have this control of unfair terms, and this it could be an explanation for banking in the survey, if a court declares that a term is unfair, that will taint the same term in a multiplicity of contracts that parties have with the same bank, for example. Once a, this is not objectivized because a court has to assess and declare the unfairness, but once declared, this could taint lots of countries. You could think, for example, in the case of the famous diesel gate, a diesel case of uh, Volkswagen as well, in which once the effect is determined, this could be standardized and extended to lots of cases. This type of laws, which are drafted this way, favor the application of or interaction with technology. So going back here, you'll see, for example, that these characteristics of standardization or objectivization are really present, very present in high level of automation, where they're more absent in the lower parts of this classification. And in that very last uh, section of this presentation, I want to apply it to see how these characteristics are present in the law. And I'm taking the example of airlines because it's very graphic. It's probably one of the laws that works better with automation. And out of the survey, remember that 50% of participants are in this sector. So when we speak about air claims, there is a European regulation, a European piece of legislation that regulates the compensation arising from delays, denied boarding, cancellation of flights. I think we are all missing flights at this uh, time of, 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 the, of the year already. Um, so if you, see, if you see in this regulation, the first characteristic of objectivization, remember whether the system can determine the breach without a human expert. Well, one of the events that triggers liability is delay. And delay is calculated as a combination of time plus distance, okay? So for example, if it's 2000 kilometers, you need to have three hours of delay to get some compensation. This asset is calculated by connecting to flight data. This is what companies and the most advanced companies are doing. They are not resorting to any human experts at all. This is because the law has drafted, has designed a breach that is zero one, yes or no, and moreover, they have, there is sufficient data to assess it. The second characteristic, remember, was standardization, that the same law applies to a variety of cases. Well, <clears throat> this directive, this, sorry, this regulation, this piece of legislation, establishes different types of compensations for delay, cancel flights or denied boarding, which is 200, 400 or 600 euros, depending on the distance of the uh, flight. And this is the same compensation that every passenger receives. Therefore, it's very easy to standardize. It's very easy to automate. However, this does not impede individual or compensation that extends, exceeds this, this uh, fixed rates. But most companies in the sectors, they either do not handle those individual claims or they do not handle them to the same extent of automation. This is what themselves have declared, which once again highlights this specific characteristic of the law for automation. So if you compare the high level of automation with the low ones, it's it's easy to understand why general claim platforms cannot automate to the same extent. They deal with different applicable laws, with different cases, which are mostly individualized. Also think of insurance. You have a car accident. Well, every car accident is, is distinct, which makes it with different damages, which makes it probably different to automize. We could probably think of cases of mass torts in which probably this outcome could be different. But in individual cases, it is not. 
So the law has something to say. So, and with this I finish, to the initial questions as to whether there are legal rules that are better suited for technology than others, I think that they are. I believe that we should start this debate. We should start to analyze once again, if we decide to automate a contract and embed it in, in blockchain, what would the applicable law be? What would the best applicable law be in terms of liability, in terms of breach, in terms of all the legal consequences that a contract could trigger, same in banking, same in fine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What would the best applicable law be? As David was saying in the presentation, the common law was very successful in finance, was very successful in commercial law. So in the competition that was triggered in the 20th century, we could clearly say that the common law is the champion. What will happen in the 21st century? Who would be the champion when we have to decide on autonomous contracts, on autonomous legal relationships, on autonomous litigation? Which legal system will succeed? Thank you.